I'm going to ask this question, why parity? Why do we care about parity? And of course, what is parity? Okay. Why do we care about, about that question? But to motivate all this, we want to talk about, I want to make sure that we're all on the same foot in here. Um, we have, I know we have some physicists in the audience. So this talk is not really geared for you. It's geared for you know, really smart people who want to get some foot in on what, what the standard cosmology is and how that jibes with observations. Why could, we, why could we make statements like the universe is expand at this given rate? You know, what are the observational, um, do we have observational wiggle room to, to make any other statement about, about the, the universe as it stands today? But then, you know, part of this motivation is to show that the modern, our standard cosmology um, works pretty well. It, it really works well, um, the, meaning the theory that I'm going to talk about here um, works really well in the face of the precision data that we have. But there are problems. And these problems are actually mainly theoretical problems. And um, then I'll talk about something that you've all probably heard a lot about, cosmic inflation. And how cosmic inflation alleviates some of these problems. But I'll point to yet another problem with cosmic inflation. And then I will bring in this original question here, why parity? And then I'll, if, hopefully there'll be time to talk about all this. I will talk about the barrier and asymmetry problem. In a sense, that's the problem. Okay. So what do we mean by this barrier and asymmetry problem? I'll talk about, I'll introduce that idea. Um, and then I'll provide a mechanism that will be related to this question about wide parity. And then I will end, not with necessarily a conclusion, but with some open-ended questions. So first of all, why do we care about parity violation? Well, we have to go back to like 1956. Before 1956, we knew from experimental data that the, weak, that the electromagnetic interaction and the strong interaction, for example, um, basically had the following feature. If I studied a physical system, in a, given, in a given frame of reference, in this case, if I study, for example, the decay of a particle called the pion. So the pion is a particle that's made up of two quarks. It's a bouncer of two quarks. And this pion has zero spin. And hence, it doesn't, it doesn't have a preferred handedness. So when we talk about the handedness of a particle, we're really talking about throwing a football. If I throw a football with my right hand and it spins and goes in the same direction to you, versus throwing it with my left hand and it goes in the same direction, this quantity, the product of the spin and its momentum towards you, is a quantity called helicity. So I can have left-handed helicity and right-handed helicity. And that's what we mean by handedness here. So now the pion is a particle that actually has no spin. But when it decays, it produces two particles with a spin. So a, a pion could decay into a heavy version of the electron called a muon. And that has a given spin. And the other particle it would produce is something called a neutrino which is a chargeless particle with spin as well. And so because the spin is conserved, meaning that it had zero spin, the product of the spin of these two particles that are left have to add up to be zero. Okay? And it turns out that if I look at these um, particles that have zero spin that decay into particles with opposite spin, the electromagnetic interaction and the strong interaction obey, will produce particles of equal spin all the time. That's what we mean by parity symmetry. The handedness of the system, if I change it from a left-handed system to its mirror image, I will, um, that the, the probability of those particles decaying in one handedness is the same as it decaying in the other handedness. Okay? That's what we mean by parity symmetry. And so all of the interactions were thought to actually obey this basic symmetry of nature. All right? um, I'll get into, if for any laser physicists here, we, you, you understand that also in an atomic system, this is the case as well. Um, these are what we call selection rules. Now, Yi and Lang realized that when they looked through the data, there was no statement about, about the weak interaction. Okay? This is the interaction that's responsible for something called beta, de beta decay. And what they, they realized was that since there was no data, they should not assume that parity is violated. And they proposed an experiment. And the result of that experiment, done by Madame Wu at Columbia, won them the Nobel Prize. So let me explain what this experiment is. is. So, what we're looking at here, pointer. I guess I don't need it. Um, so what we're looking at here is the following thing. We're looking at a neutron that's made up of three quarks. We, it's made up of an up quark and two down quarks in a bound state. And this neutron will decay into a proton. 
And in doing so, it releases, it emits the carrier of that force, which is something called a W boson. It looks like the photon of the weak interaction. And it'll also produce an, an electron and an antineutrino. So let's look at this interaction here. We have an up, a down quark that be, an up quark that becomes a down quark. So that's here. Once that happens, the neutron becomes a proton. And when the up quark becomes a down quark, it emits this photon, this, uh, this, um, this W boson, and then produces an electron and an antineutrino. This is a mistake. That should be a bar here for the antineutrino. <coughs> if I look at this, if I do this experiment, and I look at these electrons being produced as pi ions as a neutron becomes a proton, in this real experiment, it's really carbon-60 becoming nickel-60, OK? Um, if, I, if I look at this process, and I look to see the mirror image of this process, it will now produce a right-handed electron and a left-handed um, antineutrino. I never see this. I only see this, ex I only see this result. All right? So the mirror image of this interaction, here is a mirror image, does not exist in nature. And at the time, we didn't have the theory for that. And the triumph of the standard model of Glashow, Weinberg, and Salam was to figure out what that theory is. Okay? So everything you hear about the Higgs particles, that's all part of the story. How, 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 why is it that nature does not have this? So today we find ourselves in a similar situation that when I was a postdoc, we realized that we never did this, we never did this test for gravity. So we now have to ask ourselves, what are the experimental situations that we find ourselves in, in gravity, or applied general relativity, which is cosmology, to explain this? And that's sort of the motivational aspect of this talk. <coughs> so for those of you who are string theorists in this audience, there are some aspects of this talk that does hinge on string theory, but it's not necessary, OK? So I'm here to tell you that I'm a friend of the string theorists, but I'm also a friend of other people and other approaches as well. Right, you've got to be friendly to everybody. Um, hi, my friends out there in Stringland. Okay. All right, so now I want to give a little, I put everything in the cosmological context, so let's move on. So the thing I want us to take away here is that cosmology is nothing more than applied general relativity. And so I'm going to explain that to you. So the discovery of general relativity basically says that we should no longer think of space and time as this empty stage that we move about, it is dynamical um, as we are dynamical. We move because we are able to be attracted to objects gravitationally because space does bend. So because of the, the dynamics of space, um, this happens. And this happens because of something called the Einstein field equations. I guess I can't write it down here. Somewhere. Um, so the Einstein field equation, which is a set of field equations like electromagnetism. How electromagnetism tells us how the electric and the magnetic field bends in the presence of electric and magnetic um, sources. Likewise, matter and energy sources like planets and stars and black holes. Likewise, there's a set of field, fields that bend. And that field is the field of space and time. Sometimes we call that the metric field. Okay. So there are consequences for this in cosmology because we can apply the Einstein equations to the entire space-time of our universe if we know the, the distribution of matter in the universe itself. So the big game in cosmology is to, first of all, measure that and um, make a couple of assumptions. And now I want to tell you what these assumptions are. So what is standard cosmology? Standard cosmology are these three pillars. Two of these pillars are observational and one is theoretical. The first pillar is a cosmological principle, which basically is um, a beefed up version of the Copernican principle. We are not special. The, uh, every, point in, every point in the universe looks the same. Every direction in the universe looks the same. That's basically a symmetry principle. The second principle, and so we are now have observational evidence of this principle, and we'll talk about that in a second. Is it really the case that the universe does look the same at all vantage points? And then the second principle is the Hubble law, which tells you that if I look at galaxies far away from us, galaxies further away from us move faster than galaxies closer to us. And they themselves move um, at rates proportional to their distance from each other. And if I combine these two ideas, these two principles, and I use Einstein's field equations for the dynamics of space and time, which are tuple, 10 couple nonlinear differ differential equations, I find that that theory, this mother theory, spits out one unique solution 
uh, modulo the topology. So there's one unique solution for the space time of, um, for these two, these two um, print pillars, and that's an expanding or contracting homogeneous and isotropic space time. So let's um, turn to this little cartoon here. Imagine at the surface of this balloon, I tack on a coordinate system at every point on the surface. So I have x, y, z coordinate system at every point of that surface. And then someone starts blowing up this balloon at a constant rate. So if I'm a galaxy here and I look at this other galaxy, and this is the radius, this thing that we call AFT, if AFT starts growing at some rate, I will actually see, even though I, I feel that I'm fixed in my own coordinate system, I will see another galaxy move away from me. And I will see a, another galaxy that's further away from me move faster because of the angular velocity, right? The angular, the tangential velocity on the point of the surface here. And that, what I've just shown you there, is nothing more than the solution of the Einstein equations. That's called the Hubble. What I've shown you there is, a, is, is the fact that Einstein's theory predicts actually that our universe actually is this situation. It's an expanding four-dimensional space-time um, or three-dimensional surface embedded in the four-dimensional space-time where A of t is what we call a scale factor and it's expanding. And the natural consequence of this is that we are fixed or we are co-moving with this expansion and the natural consequence is that we will see other objects moving away faster at the further they are from us. So that was the first triumph of the Einstein equation. Physicists immediately jumped on the bandwagon and started doing more calculations. They realized that actually there's a thermal bath there, so the universe is very hot and dense. And therefore, the hotter it got, then all of the matter will ionize. All of the, the atoms, including hydrogen, will ionize, and the universe will find itself in a state. In fact, if you do this calculation, 300,000 years after, after this initial time, okay, that you should actually see the decoupling or the, sorry, the formation, the universe cools, and then I'll see um, at some time as the universe cools, hydrogen, I'll reach the ionization energy of hydrogen, and an electron will bind to, to, um, to the proton. It will, it will scatter photons, and that photons right, will actually be in equilibrium with that situation, and that, there should be a, a relic thermal energy associated with that. And so it predicts something that we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. So physicists were looking for this background radiation as a consequence of this expanding space-time. And lo, lo and behold, 1967, so before I tell you about 1967, so the picture we should have now is that at some early time, um, I won't talk about this t is equal to zero, that's another talk. I can come back and talk about that in the future if you want me to. But if, what this theory does predict is that a universe filled with radiation will form hydrogen for the first time and there'll be a relic background radiation that we can look for. And this actually has a particular spectrum, and it's a perfect black body spectrum. Two things to keep in mind, and as the universe continues to cool, some of that stuff clusters and forms galaxies. So in 1967, this was measured, the Nobel Prize was given to it, and this was what was measured, where like a chicken inside of an egg, we've cut the egg in half and opened it out, and we're looking at at that time, 300,000 years, and we see exactly this radiation. And of course, we saw more things. We saw deviations from that average temperature. Hot and cold spots correspond to troughs and peaks in the sea of, these, um, of, of this radiation, because it's not, oh, there's, it, there's an average temperature, and then there are these fluctuations. Today, we're going to talk a lot about that fluctuation. This is the WMAP satellite. Um, I was fortunate enough last year to hang out with the WMAP group um, at Princeton on sabbatical and got intimate with this data a little bit, although I'm a theorist. Um, what we're looking at here is a prediction that from, cosmic, from inflation. We'll talk about inflation in a second. So the red, the red line is the power spectrum, or basically the Fourier transform of those dots, those undulations. Okay, This is wavelength. So we're looking at the relative sizes of these fluctuations and we're comparing them to each other in the sky. And we are looking at how similar or different they are from each other. And the prediction of inflation, which we'll talk about in a second, and the, 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 the black spots is the data. Okay, so this is the best fit to the data using four parameters. Um, and this is something called the, po the power spectrum of the polarization of the photons. <coughs> 
So this is kind of cute. You can actually um, associate these fluctuations with um, acoustics. So this is literally an acoustic peak, if you think in terms of sound, for those of you who are more comfortable with sound. If I play an instrument, the instrument resonates at different frequencies, but there's always an acoustic peak associated with the length of a flute, for example. I bought my soprano sax here. Um, and it turns out that the universe has that, acoustic, that, that characteristic size. So from that peak, we can deduce the size of the universe at that time. Coincidentally, it's just an A note, 50 octaves below uh, middle C. And this is the latest and greatest, the Planck data satellite. Um, and we are currently analyzing that data as we speak, we the community, okay? And but the Planck data is consistent with the standard model that we have. There are some anomalies, but that's not the purpose of this talk today, but it is interesting. So what do we learn from this data? We can look at this data and we can see that um, some weird things happen. What we thought um, that was so special about us turns out to be, um, so I always like to tell people, you know, um, if you ever felt like you were never a minority, this is the time to feel like you're a minority <laughs> because this is you, all right? We are a minority. Um, we share that in common, okay? We're a minority in the scheme of the universe. This, these, 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 um, these dark guys here are the majority. And um, we have no idea what this is. People say, say various things. There's a Discover Magazine article that came out on Dark Energy this month, and I was quoted at the end with my own crazy theory. I regret it actually interviewing with Discover because now all my colleagues think I'm even more of a crackpot, okay? <laughs> Um, okay, and so I won't talk about these things today. I will, I'm going to talk about actually, I'm going to give you the minority report, okay? <laughs> so who ordered that? I mean, who gave us this kind of universe? So my friend and colleague Sean Carroll wrote a book, a paper called A Preposterous Universe because it is preposterous. We always thought that we were the main stuff. So as I said, we have the standard, just a, we have the standard picture of the universe that, as I said, these three pillars predicts an expanded universe with the features that we see in this cosmic microwave background radiation. It predicts that relic background radiation. We went and looked for it, all right? This was done by Gamow, George Gamow, and Fred Hoyle, and people like that, way before the 60s, and we found it. So we had a model that explained the Hubble law, but also predicted this cosmic microwave background radiation. But what it did not predict was these fluctuations. Nobody, what it predicted was a smooth and featureless universe that's expand. But unfortunately, we are the, those very wrinkles in the universe that made the standard cosmology a limited model. We need to explain observationally why these fluctuations exist. Because those are the things that grew into the structure that we see today. Meaning galaxies, clusters of galaxies, so on and so forth. <coughs> But there's actually a much more serious problem. So we can summarize the expansion history of the universe with this um, Penrose diagram. So a Penrose diagram is a way of, it's a conformal map, okay, um, that allows me to freeze out the, the time expansion and look at the expanded universe as a forward, set of forward and backward light cones. So in other words, let's look at it the following way. If I'm looking back at the past, it's like me shining light, right, on the back. Because meaning the fastest anything can travel is with these photons. These photons will disperse out. Okay, I'm just giving you an analogous picture here. And so there'll be a limitation as to, at the end of the day, how far those photons went back, all right, if they're traveling at the speed of light. They can only cover but a certain amount of distance, okay? How, what, what is that distance? That distance is, is, um, is its velocity, which is the speed of light, divided by the, the, the time of flight. All right. Um, I'm sorry. The velocity. Yeah, the velocity. The time. The time of flight is the distance divided by the velocity. Okay. So, so in other words, there's a limitation as to how far back we can see. So when we look back at this cosmic microwave background, okay, we're looking far back as light could, that the light could travel to us, and we see something very weird. What do we see? We see that the temperature at antipodal points of the sky, have ex the photons have exactly the same temperature. Well, 
For those of you who took thermal physics, know that uh, the, for something to reach equilibrium, you must have scattering, you must have interaction. But we know that interaction are limited by causality. Okay? You need causality for me to bump into you. But we're talking about photons here. So that means at any other point in the back, the light cones is of maximum distance this photon could travel. So this photon has the same temperature as this one, but there's no way they could have been in causal contact. And this is actually an internal inconsistency with the expanded space-time. So while it predicts this one thing, right, it has the seeds of its own destruction. And cosmologists basically swept this under the rug, okay, until Alan Guth came along. Um, Alan Guth is actually one of my mentors um, and coincidentally occupied the same office when he was at Slack and came up with inflation. So I had this idea, I have to like live up to his legacy, and I never did. I just happened to work on his theory more. All right. So the basic idea of inflation is to solve this problem. This is what we call the horizon problem. Okay? How it is that these photons can communicate with each other when they didn't have time to do that? They need to do that because we see that they have the same temperature. So Alan Guth had a really simple idea. That assumes that the expanded universe expanded at the same rate at all times. So Alan just said, oh, we can fix this problem. Let's start off with a tiny peach patch of space-time, very tiny, microscopically tiny, okay, I don't know, very tiny, I mean sub, you know, sub Fermi scale, um, less than 10 to the minus 15 centimeters, a little tiny piece of space-time, and let's assume that that space-time had something with the same property, some form of energy with the same property, so the there's no horizon problem there. Again, this is an assumption. And let's assume that stuff is so weird that it endows the space-time with negative pressure. So at some point, boom, this piece of space-time expands exponentially. And you know, like economists, when you actually do inflation, you actually have exponentially expanding functions as well. So likewise, the universe actually becomes a very, very expensive, it's on its way to a bubble, okay? Actually, we have, I have colleagues that work on bubble infl uh, inflation, so I'm looking forward to writing a paper about that, about bursting the bubble. Um, if that happens, then what happens is that all of these regions actually become encapsulated, and you solve the horizon problem if you can manage to set up a set of initial conditions with the same properties. So we've got to figure out how to do that, how to order that, okay? Do we have the physics to do that? If that's the case, life is good, dandy, but there is a bonus out of this. <clears throat> but before I, I say, I want to go a talk a little bit more about inflation. What makes inflation happen? What is this stuff that will do it? It turns out it's actually dark energy. Um, but before I actually tell you what it is, I want to get something straight here. So, we like to think about fields as things that are the carriers of forces, like the electromagnetic field. All right? But as a person that's trained in field theory, okay, as a field theorist, we know, we know that the paradigm is that everything is a field. Okay? When we write the standard model down, all of these things are, are presentations of fields. It's just that these fields are localized because they have mass. Okay? But there's one electron field, right? which is different states of the electron field. Um, and likewise, so th we must look at the paradigm of the field, no, the field paradigm. So again, if we try to do inflation, we are required to use a field because that's all we're left with. But it cannot be these other fields. These other fields don't work, okay? Because these fields screen, they undergo in screening process. They screen and they like to cluster up. We need something that's homogeneous and isotropic everywhere. So it must be a field that has no spin. And we call these fields scalar fields. Okay, so they're simple field theories. Like the electromagnetic field have spin one and they have two polarization states. You know, I can never do it properly, but. So yeah, field like this. So you really think about a field. So how does inflation work? The basic idea of inflation is that you have a field. The field has potential energy, just like the electromagnetic field could have potential energy. And it's, if something has potential energy, it's like sitting on top of a hill. And that potential energy could um, redistribute itself into kinetic energy at the end of the day through the conservation of energy. 
But in inflation, it feels a very, has a very interesting property, meaning the potential is very special. Potential is very, it's very um, um, shallow. Not shallow, but what's the word for great? Has a very um, low gradient. There's an there's a easy word for that. Flat. It's a very flat potential. So that means a field rolls very slowly. So a field rolling very slowly is like something that has friction. There's friction that's slowing it down. Okay? And it turns out that that situation, if I, if I give you a scalar field where the potential is flat, and I plug that into the Einstein equation, you have to believe me that the solution you generate is this expanding, this um, rapidly expanding space time. You just have to believe me on that. If you gave me 20 minutes of your free time, I could actually walk you through that calculation. It's a very simple calculation. Okay? Um, so I hope that. It's yeah. very flat potential uh, in different parts of space? Or, uh, yeah, that's right. This field takes values at every point in space, but it takes the same value. And then now the field evolves. So the field evolves differently, then it's like this potential is now not becoming flat anymore. So the fact that the potential remains roughly flat, it um, guarantees that this field will remain constant at different points in space. And that's exactly the situation we want for inflation. Right? So we have to, right, you can actually set this up as a Markov chain, believe it or not. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> so if that was the case, cosmologists would not really care. I wouldn't care. But why I care was, I remember when I was a grad student and I went to the very first cosmology conference in, in Morocco in 1993, um, I saw a, a young cosmology postdoc doing a calculation for inflation where he was calculating the perturbations. So in other words, this field is rolling down, but there are things called, it's a quantum field. So there are quantum perturbations. Okay? These quantum perturbations are nothing more than, think of like a little oscillator. The field has, is rolling down, and then there are little oscillators that, that, that fluctuate because of the uncertainty principle. It's a quantum mechanical system. And so these things, you can't run away from You must deal with it. It's a quantum field theory. So check this out. If you actually calculate this, um, these fluctuations of, the, of this field in this rapidly, exponentially expanding background, you get a spectrum of these oscillators, these fluctuations. And these, the spectrum has the following property. If inflation begins at some time that I give you, because I'm God physicist, okay, but we, okay, I'm, I don't mean to sound like that. I mean, I'm not. Um, anybody wants to kill inflation, talk about this, okay, this piece here. But, um, so inflation is a, uh, is a very special situation in which the region that sets causality, which we call the Hubble, the horizon, okay, um, all of the perturbations be, be, um, get generated in this region of causal contact because we're doing a local quantum field theory. Nice. But the rapid expansion takes these fluctuations, stretches it, but also amplifies it. So it turns this quantum thing into a large classical flu fluctuation with energy. So this gravitational energy dumps itself into, into these large quantum fluctuations that becomes classical, and they get stretched out of the horizon. Kind of magical, OK? Inflation ends, and now we have an ordinary evolving cosmology. These modes, these fluctuations, become frozen, and they come back into the horizon, now as classical perturbations, and they're nice and ready to source structures. And if I calculate this, and I calculate the spectrum, that's the red curve that I showed you. So what inflation does in solving the horizon problem, it's, it, pr provides a, it provides a, um, a causal microphysical mechanism for structure. So we can now take a theory of inflation, do calculations, and make predictions of, for, the, for these fluctuations in the CMB and compare it to the distribution of galaxies and clusters of galaxies today and come back to the drawing board and build better theories. So this is what it allows us to do. It allows us to do physics. But there are some caveats here. And I won't get into it now, but we should not drink the inflation Kool-Aid um, theoretically yet. It's a paradigm that is the winning paradigm right now. OK? No doubt about that. Um, but as a theorist, I still worry about this question here. So I want to leave it 
for the Google geniuses here, maybe one of you can come and help me out with this. Here's the problem. You see those like, nice little fluctuations that I calculated? They're quantum mechanical. I go get Peskin and Schroeder. He teaches me how to do these calculations. I do the calculation. Boom, I get this beautiful spectrum, right? Life is good. Well, not only these fluctuations not only um, affect the spectrum of the perturbation, they, they affect the potential. The potential also gets quantum corrected. Well, those very same things that do a nice job for the fluctuation can spoil the condition of the flatness of the potential. So many models of inflation suffer from this problem. There are some models that get around it. We can, you know, we can do a little dance. But keep that in mind that inflation is not a perfect theory as yet. So I want to um, now move on to the um, second, really the second third of the talk. What's the time? Perfect. I'm right on time. Um, so, so okay, this is good. So inflation, as I said, does this night job, solves the horizon pro problem, gives us structure formation. All right, let's do the dance. I'm going to quit my job at Dartmouth and come and hang out with you guys at Google now. But unfortunately, I have to stay and continue working on this stuff because it turns out that these fluctuations that are generated during inflation, if you look at the formalism, couples to something called a gravitational potential. Remember, this infla inf inflation field is the energy that's driving the space-time. The space-time itself is a field. The inflaton field couples to the gravitational field. A piece of this gravitational field is the good old-fashioned gravitational potential, you know, the one that the sun has on us. All right? So the universe has a gravitational potential. And that's the thing that's really sourcing right, the infall of matter into what have you. But you see, if we're going to do that, we've got to do it democratically. We can't say that the gravitational potential is this guy chilling out here, right? And the inflaton field falls into it because of the gravitational attraction. The gravitational field, too, must also democratically undergo fluctuations. You can't do one and not do the other, OK? Anyway, I'm not going to bring up any analogies for relationships. <coughs> the, the, um, the metric field also undergoes a fluctuation. And the fluctuation of the metric field is something called a gravitational wave. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And just like how the inflaton field gave us a, a picture of what structure might look like in the early universe, how the primordial structures are, are formed, we want to ask a question about what is the physical role of these gravitational waves. And yes, it will be connected to parity. So that's kind of where we're going here, just so that to reorient you that I don't want to take you too far out. So what is a gravitational wave? What we're looking at upstairs there is um, a wave. This wave has an amplitude, and I'm, I'm calling this amplitude h. And this amplitude oscillates, in this case, as a function of time. And what, this is a gravitational wave. right? So it's, it's the fluctuation. It's the, it is the modulation of, um, of space-time itself. Okay. Um, and so if I look at the second line down here, I'm looking at something, a schematic of the LIGO, um, LIGO gravitational wave detector, which are two arms, it's an interferometer, right, with, with um, laser light going back and forth being reflected. And as a gravitational wave passes through that thing, it actually stretches the space, and therefore the arms will get stretched. And they'll get stretched in a way that as a gravitational wave passes through, there's a compression in the um, in, in the horizontal direction and a refraction in the vertical direction so it does this and this, right, as you see here. So if you're a tall, if you're a tall person, you get tall as the gravitational wave passes through, but as the gravitational wave um, undergoes an undulation, a refraction, it makes you a little bit chubbier. So that's what a gravitational wave does to objects in space-time. The space-time itself stretches and compresses as a gravitational wave passes through. Okay? And that intuition should be consistent with, um, with um, space-time as a field because electromagneti ma electromagnetism is a, f is a field that propagates through space-time. It needs space-time to propagate within, but the metric is, is space-time itself. So it supports its own fluctuation. So it must contract and expand space itself. <coughs> so that's a gravitational wave. 
And what I'm showing you here is the first equation that I'm going to have. I'm going to have a few equations now from um, here on. But this equation is quite il illustrative. What we're looking at here is a wave equation. Actually, if I solve the Einstein equation for a gravitational wave, um, normally, if I, you see that middle term there, if I ignore that term, set it to zero, in flat space, a gravitational wave will just be these two terms, which is nothing more than a wave moving at the speed of light. But you see that middle term there? You see that you have A, which is a scale factor. In an expanding background, A over, um, A, dA dt divided by A is a constant. That's the Hubble parameter. So then that Hubble parameter is quite large during inflation. So what ends up happening, if I solve that wave equation, um, what starts off as an ordinary wave gets squeezed, meaning that the phase um, of this wave, the phase with all the, I produce a, a distribution of these waves at different frequencies, and they all get the same phase. This is a phenomenon called quantum squeezing. And this is exactly how inflation surmises to, to amplify and stretch the gravitational waves. Um, and this is quite important, because that means inflation predicts a spectrum of gravitational wave and that's what we're going after now. We, when we say we, um, the smoking gun of inflation is to find gravitational wave, this is really a big part of the story. That middle term is the thing that's um, creating um, special phase relationships um, between all, the, all, all of the, 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 the spectrum of all the gravitational waves. So another place that you can imagine seeing gravitational waves is if, if I look at binary systems of, say, um, neutron stars. In this case, this is a computer simulation. Um, credit goes to LIGO, I believe. So maybe we can get corrected later on. But anyway, what we're looking at here is what, how a gravitational wave changes the space-time um, as a binary, strongly gravitating binary system goes around each other. So notice you see the swirl in motion. But there's a problem here. Um, as I told you, um, if we are to really believe this picture of structure formation and inflation, we need to uh, um, understand not only the fluctuations of the inflaton field, um, we also need to understand the following problem. The universe is not just inf inflation and gravitational waves. The universe is us. It's made up of electrons and protons and all these nice things. But one of the things we know about our standard model of particle physics is that there are equal amounts of matter of electrons and anti-electrons, the positron. So for every particle, we know that there's equal amounts of both. So what do I mean by that? If I look really far back and I try to find where this um, the equal amounts of you know, what we are um, is, we don't find it. We don't see any matter, we don't see any antimatter. Um, we, in other words, we don't see anti galaxies. Okay? So here's a problem the galaxies are the structures that are formed. <laughs> so why am I not seeing anti galaxies? If the universe starts off in a symmetric state, and I believe the story of inflation, I have to confront the biasing of matter over antimatter, either during inflation or something special happens after inflation where I got rid of all the antimatter. And so when I was at Slack, me and my, my boss and my, another postdoc, um, Mohammed Sheikh, Sheikh, Sheikh Jabari, um, thought about this problem in the context of inflation. We said, maybe there's something special about inflation that can do the job, and maybe the gravity waves are the hidden part of the story. So the story begins really in 1967. What we're dealing with is the genesis of leptons. So remember, electrons and neutrinos and muons are all leptons. Um, so once you, if you can form leptons over anti-leptons, um, you actually can produce baryons much later on. Okay? Um, so this is called leptogenesis. And so in 19, the name of the game here is to not explain the asymmetry. That's not enough. You have to explain that number. What is the difference between leptons over anti-leptons divided by the density of photons in galaxies? So this number is a universal number in every galaxy. And this number also, so you can measure this number just by looking at galaxies, um, or you can measure this number in the WMAP data, data, and you get the same number. So the name of the game is to not explain the asymmetry, 
but to explain the number. And that's the number right there. So if you get anything, up, you, even if you have a mechanism to explain the asymmetry, your theory could still be wrong, unless you have to explain this number. So in 1967, um, Andrei Sakharov, um, in a home prison, that's the legend, um, that's a picture of him right here, he um, came up with the three necessary conditions to um, explain this, um, lep this asymmetry. So let me walk you through this, because this is actually very important for the, to understand the rest of the talk. So in our standard model, the statement that you have equal amounts of matter over antimatter is really a statement of the current. So every bit of matter, the electrons, all the fields actually have a current. Um, and the, the current is really, in particle accelerator, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the current-current interactions. And there's an equation for those currents. And the equation is that the rate of change of the current is zero. So the vacuum, you know, the ground state of the standard model, um, all the currents are vanishing, the rate of change. So if I start off with a situation, like in the early universe, where the current is zero because it's vacuum, then the rate of change of the current is going to remain zero. So I can, and I can never, the standard model doesn't have the physics to produce more current or number density of particles. Um, so, you, so that's really the problem. But the standard model has another statement, that you have a, an equation for the anti-current, and that is also zero. So the first thing you need to do is to come up with new physics that says that the change of the current is not zero. You have to figure out how to speak to the standard model or extend it in a way that that is no longer the case. But that's not enough to produce a matter, a matter asymmetry. You need to also bias the amount of anti current over anti-current. So if I produce more current, if I produce more matter and antimatter, imagine I can do that. If I'm producing the same rate, of matter and antimatter, they annihilate. So I need to simultaneously do something called CP violation, which is, notice the word parity is in there. I need to bias, I need to have something like the weak interaction going on for the leptons. Okay? The interchange of charge, of the charge, and the handedness of the system has to bias one um, production channel of matter over antimatter. And while that is happening, the other degrees of freedom, the photons and all these things, the radiation, has to be out of equilibrium with that production mechanism. Okay? Because you learn from thermodynamics that if a system is in equilibrium with its environment, it will equilibrate back to its time reversal, right? which is matter becoming equal to antimatter. <coughs> so this is the only page of equations because this is actually what we're doing in our model. So the theory that we're working with here is a theory of gravity that encodes parity violation naturally. What I mean by this is that this theory takes gravity, which is parity symmetric. It doesn't care about a left-handed system and a right-handed system. It treats them the same mathematically, and therefore its predictions will be the same. Um, and what I mean by that now is that gravitational waves, I'll go, I'm going to produce left-handed gravitational waves. I throw a gravitational wave in with my left hand and the right-handed gravitational wave, it will produce both of them at the same amplitude. But it turns out that I can do something to general relativity that biases that. And this is done by the great mathematicians Chern and Simons. So this term here is a Chern-Simons term. And this term seems to be very robust in any, most approaches to quantum gravity has this term in it. String theory, loop quantum gravity, so this is, seems to be a natural extension to general relativity. And what I'm going to show you is that if I solve for a gravity wave with this theory, something really cool happens during inflation. And that's all I want to say about there. This theta thing here is the inflaton field that's coupling to this churn simons term. Think of this churn simons term as chopping off the arm one hand <laughs> and throwing the football on the other hand. So this is how the idea works. What I'm now going to say is, um, we're now going to talk about the possibility of producing leptons over anti-leptons and trying to see if inflation can give us all three Sakharov conditions in one shot. So here's the basic idea. If you guys get this, I'm going to be so happy. I mean, so I'm, I'm going to try. Okay. The basic idea is the following. 
Inflation is driven by a field called the inflaton. This inflaton field takes the same value at every place in, in space. But that's the amplitude of the field. It's a field, so the field also has a phase. And it turns out that the phase of the inflaton field is that thing that couples to the chern simons term. So if this phase couples, that means that phase is going to affect other waves that are produced, in this case, gravitational waves. So what happens is that the inflaton field has the same value. It couples to gravity through this chern simons term. And as a result, the inflaton field, which drives inflation, that means it's put in my system four out of equilibrium because nothing can catch up with that rate of expansion. So you get it not, um, out of equilibrium very naturally from just the, the environment of inflation. That same inflaton field sources gravitational waves. But it sources, it sources a gravitational wave in a way that biases the production of left-handed over right-handed gravitational waves. Bio, um, biologists call this circular dichroism, or physicists call it birefringence. Okay? It is the preference of one-handedness of a wave um, over another one in the amplitude. So I have to, I have to prove, show you that that is the case. But it turns out that it also does something really cool. I believe in page 199 of volume two of Weinberg, it turns out that the standard model has something called a gravitational anomaly that people didn't pay attention to. Well, people did pay attention to it. They just couldn't find a, a, a use for it. And that gravitational anomaly is actually the statement that D of the currents is not zero but it's proportional to the chern simons term itself. So if I have a non-vanishing chern simons term during inflation, I will naturally get a, the possibility of producing more leptons after, uh, over anti-leptons. So what I'm saying, if you buy this story, the story, the, the inflaton field does all three things at the same time, all three of the Sakharov condition. So let's see in detail if it works. For the rest of the talk, um, the picture you should have in your, your mind is that inflation is like this cup of coffee, and as you stir the coffee around one direction over the other, I can produce gravity waves that stir in one direction over another direction. And that stirring can pop matter out of the vacuum. And it does it in a way that's out of, that is out of equilibrium. The out of, well, it's an, a rapidly expanding cup of coffee. So if you want to put Starbucks out of business, you do inflation with coffee. All right. So this is a statement. Remember I told you you have d mu of the j. j is the the lepton and anti-lepton number, it's proportional to this chern simons term. So if this chern simons term is non-vanishing, the left-hand side is going to be non-vanishing. But remember, this chern simons term is related to R is a gravitational um, curvature, right? So to calculate that thing, I have to solve a modified wave equation for the gravity wave. Now, this is very important. And it's also a very beautiful equation. It's the left-hand side. If the right-hand side was 0, I have the normal situation for inflation, for gravity waves, that first equation I showed you. And so I'm going to produce equal amounts of left and right-handed gravity waves. But because of the presence of this chern simons term, what happens is that the left-handed the, the left gravity wave is soft by itself and the inflaton field. So, and notice here, there's a minus sign here. So I'll get a wave with an amplitude that's proportional to this chern simons term. So I can get an exponentially amplified, sorry, right-handed gravity wave, and at the same time, an exponentially damped left-handed gravity wave. And that is the source of the left-right asymmetry. That is the statement of parity violation. Okay? Left and right no longer evolve in the, um, in the same way. Well, that's nice, because if that is the case, then I can I find h left and h right. If I plug it in, r or dual, because r or dual depends on h left and h right, I find that r or dual is non-vanishing. So the parity violation immediately sources the production of leptons. So I can actually calculate that. All right, so the statement here is that the solutions I get are exponentially growing and damped gravitational waves. And it's parity violating because Parity takes left and to right, but in this case, because the amplitudes are different, it doesn't happen. All right, so these are some colleagues that were. All right, last slide. So I can now calculate this RR dual and plug it in, and I get this, this number, I get the answer. 
And guess what? It only depends on two things. So there's very little fine tuning in this model. And what I find is that it depends on Hubble over M Planck, which is actually an observable measured in the fluctuation spectrum of the WMAP and Planck data. And then it depends also on the value of the infoton field, which is something that we can measure uh, by measuring the ratio of the amplitude of gravity waves over the power spectrum of the scalar fluctuations of the infoton field. It also depends on, you can say, well, which, um, if I produce a full spectrum of different wavelengths of, of gravity waves of left and right handed amounts, which ones contribute the most to the production of leptons? So the picture you should have in your mind is that I have these gravity waves. They're interacting with the leptons in the vacuum, and they're popping them out during inflation. And they're popping them out so quickly that it catches up with the dilution that inflation actually presents by expanding. So if I calculate that number, and I plug in the value of Hubble over M Planck, and if the gravity waves that contribute are 10 to the, roughly 10 to the 12 giga electron volts, which is perfectly fine, so it's a very high energy process, I could get the observed baryon asymmetry. So, so what I present to you here is a theory that, that seems to be quite minimal. If we believe in the standard model of inflation, and we believe in a standard model, and we believe that gravity interacts with the standard model the same you know, traditional way that we expect as a field theory, then this seems to do the job. And what we've done is we've found a nice job for the gravity waves. It's not just hanging around there. Nature made use of it. So can we test this idea? So I should have about five minutes left. OK. <clears throat> and the answer is yes. So two ways to test this idea. So some colleagues of mine on the gravitational wave um, astronomy side are looking to see the effects today of these birefringent gravity waves. And these are some of my colleagues um, that we've worked on this. And the basic idea is that when I look at a binary system and I look at the, the distribution of gravity waves that, um, that, are, that we detect, I, I won't see, I'll see a bimodal distribution. I'll see two different distributions for left and right gravity waves. If I look at a binary system, what happens when I look at a binary uh, system that produces gravity waves, I can never find one that's completely in line with my line of sight. So there's always an inclination angle that I'm going to measure. So something really cute happens when you have parity violation. And this statement summarizes it. In the same way that we, um, that we say that the curvature of space-time bends light passing close to strongly gravitating, a strongly gravitating body, we may say that the effect of a gravitational parity violating correction is to rotate the apparent inclination angle of the binary system's orbital angular momentum axis either towards or away from us. So it changes the apparent inclination angle as opposed to its true inclination angle. All right, and the other way that we can potentially test this is using this cosmic microwave background radiation. And yes? So I'm sorry, is that, would you be detecting the difference in inclination angle as measured by gravity waves compared to optical? Exactly. Okay. Thanks for bringing that up. It does, you have to also measure an optical inclination angle and then compare the deviation from the expected. Now, the other way that I think is much cooler if we can do this, and it will win my, my friend Brian Keaton the Nobel Prize, um, I'm just going to be the theorist that just hangs, you know, goes to Stockholm because he's going to build the experiment. So what the cosmic microwave, what inflation predicts is this red curve for gravity waves. Okay, this is what we call a B-mode polarization. What any theory that has a parity violating gravity waves produces um, a different curve, an order of magnitude larger than the red curve. I'm sorry, which is that black curve up there. So it produces a stronger signal, a signal that's more detectable. And right now, my friend Brian Keaton, he's good buddies with, um, with Jim Simons. Jim Simons gave him like a crap load of money to build a satellite to actually look for this effect. Because notice it's a churn Simons term. So, um, so thank you, Jim, for um, funding Brian. Maybe you can fund me one day. Um, he's, a, he's a great guy, by the way. So and this is um, this, uh, the Simons Array Telescope that my friend Brian, you should invite him out here to talk about, about that design. Um, very you know, cutting edge um, bolometry technology, um, detectors that are way beyond anything available um, anywhere. Um, you might want to use some of that tech. I don't know what you guys can do with detectors. Um, so here are the stats on that. And I want to conclude. 
So one of the biggest questions in particle cosmology is a question of baryogenesis or leptogenesis. It's not sufficient to just talk about structure formation without talking about how matter won over antimatter. It's a real observational question. And what I presented to you was a model that requires very little new physics, no extra dimensions, minimal fine tunings. Of course, you need to drink the Kool-Aid of inflation. Um, and it may be testable by measuring anomalous parity violating power spectra, as the last slide I showed you. And LIGO, or maybe one day LISA, if it flies, might be able to see these waveforms in binary mergers, like black holes and, um, black holes and neutron stars and such. And this is a great opportunity to test a fundamental issue in the cos using cosmic microwave background um, polarization. And I want to end to make my string theory friends happy because the story actually started with a string theory um, investigation, looking at this churn simons term, that it's possible that if you find this effect, um, we might be closer to actually making model independent statements about string theory or theories of quantum gravity. Thanks for having me out. Depends on the Charles Simon's term, uh, which depends on the uh, intraton uh, field. Uh, wouldn't have it? Wouldn't it have vanished by now and only be apparent in you know, close to the Big Bang? Um, that's right. So one thing: there are two effects that could happen. One is a propagating effect, which is that you can look at a gravitational wave traveling to us from the CMB to us. So it, took, it you know, was affected by this, churn, this field back then, and it propagated to us. And it turns out, as it propagates, that effect becomes stronger. And another one is a source effect, that if the field exists today, it may source. And you're correct that um, there are cosmological constraints that tell us that this, in, this field cannot exist. And if it does exist, at the very most, it's the, it's the dark energy. And we know that it has to be like 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. Good question. The current state of the gravity wave detection experiments, I mean, it seems like those have been, those have been online for a while now. Has there been any results coming out of it? Or? You know, they're very optimistic. I mean, I was just visiting my friend Nico Yunez and um, Neil Cornish, who are heavy into that game. And they're very optimistic. And a big, you know, the, they are optimistic that they will f detect a gravity wave, but the question is a background noise. Like, they have to always figure out how to get rid of the things that may appear to be a gravity wave. But because we already saw the binary pulsar, um, you, know, um, <clears throat> we, you know, we know that there should be a gravity wave out there. It's now a question of, so I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm obviously not privy to the real techn technical challenges that they, they're dealing with, because it's not my, not my pay grade, but um, we're, the part of my community that deals with gravity wave, we're very optimistic. Have you ever been certain you'd really de detected a real gravity wave as opposed to just some truck passing by? Like, <laughs> you know, this is exactly the issue. They, want, they have to figure out what that signal to noise is. So the question is, how do you characterize that? So they, this is, um, they have to you know, understand what those foregrounds are. And so a big name of the game is to, to figure out what a fake signal is and then model it to subtract it off. Do you have directional information that can tell you like it's coming from the exact area of the sky that this binary is located? Um, that I don't know. I think Advanced LIGO and LISA um, would be designed to, to do that because if you had LISA flying and LIGO, then you can, and you saw the same event, then you'd be able to, you have two different locations. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Yes. E even for LIGO, because there's that's why so, I did. So, several of them are scattered around the Earth. So. Yes, the answer is yes. Yes? Do we have any idea what kind of interactions the uh, photon field might have, so you know, whether we'd be able to produce it in an accelerator or something like that? Oh, that's a good question. So the answer is um, that sh we should be able to do that. And <clears throat> that's why last year, me and David Spergel and my postdoc worked on a new model of inflation that is not based on a scalar field but it's based on something that looks very similar to quantum electrodynamics. And um, in that case, inflation is actually driven by ordinary fields in nature. And so 
we're working now, that paper was recently published in JCAP, so you can look for that paper. It's called, um, it's a model based on vector fields. So the photons, the photon and fermions are driving inflation. And um, so you could, for example, try to recreate that situation at the Large Hadron Collider, or the, the, internet, the ILC, and see if you see something that smells like inflation. That, that, I mean, that's a forward-thinking idea, but we did that to show that as a proof of principle that you can do inflation with ordinary fields in nature. So part of that was to ask this question that you're asking. Yeah. If an anti-galaxy were to exist, what would be the observational? Uh, yeah, so there is, that's right, there is, you know, um, around every galaxy there are, there's gas, so like hydrogen, for example, so you would see a lot of like annihilation um, going on if there was an anti-galaxy. So you would basically see huge flux of, of photons. So you know we can imagine that um, you know we do have anomalies in the sky. We have things that you know call cosmic rays, and uh, we have very high energy cosmic rays. Maybe it could be that if, um, that that is a result of some huge amount of antimatter out there. It's not my pay grade, but um, so far every you know galaxy person I've spoken to. Um, tell me that there's no evidence of huge anti-galaxies out there, but I tend to keep an open mind about things that I'm ignorant about. <clears throat> so far I've been able to answer everybody's question. This is scaring me. This is Google. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. The one part of the talk that said ordinary matter is a distinct minority in the universe, but then in another part of the talk you show that Factor of ten ratio between matter and antimatter. So I got a little bit confused. Okay, good. I'm glad you brought that up. No, we saw a factor of ten difference in um, in ordinary left and right symmetric gravity waves producing inflation and left right asymmetric gravity waves. So that's a factor of ten. But it's interesting that that factor of ten may be the same factor of ten to give you um, the barring asymmetry. So. What we're looking at is really the, the, um, the gravity wave power spectrum, you know, the distribution of the frequencies of the gravity waves. And what we see is that we have higher power for larger wavelengths of gravity waves um, if they are left-right asymmetric, and lower power if they were left-right symmetric. Um, I don't have an intuition for, as to why that is the case, <clears throat> but it's good to think, good to think about. Yes. Why is parity uh, an almost perfect symmetry? Why is it uh, symmetry at all? Because I, you know, it's uh, well. So what? You know, I'm curious. In, in physics, there's just a whole bunch of these near symmetries, which are symmetries that are slightly broken, but they're there. So parity is one of these things. Why does it <coughs> exist at all? At all? Well, well, first of all, we, okay. I think what you mean by that is. Um, in the weak interaction, parity, of course, is maximally violated. We never see the other thing. But that's right. In terms of all the forces combined, the weak is the odd man out. Okay? It's the one that violates parity. And the others, um, if it violates parity, it's just like very weakly or not at all. And so, to be honest with you, there is no good answer to that question. We don't know the answer to that. Part of why I pursued this line of research was to understand, you know, to, as a to use gravity as a diagnostic, theoretically, to understand that question. Because in this case, parity is just weakly violated. right? It's in between. The talk I was really going to give you guys was a partial answer to your question, which was to show that actually gravity and the weak interaction are really the same theory. And um, the parity violation is a consequence of a parity symmetric theory that includes gravity and the weak interaction. But that talk had um, was I was, a friend of mine warned me to not give that talk here because, um, well, it was, there were no words in the talk. <laughs> oh, very little words in the talk. <laughs> no, but, but, uh, 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 electromagnetic interaction and the weak interaction have been unified into the electroweak theory. And that's how right. does the electroweak theory deal with parity? That's right, that's right. So that's a very good point. I, I noticed your question. Um, so, okay, so the electro, Weak interaction, that's a very good point. 
The electroweak force actually includes both electromagnetism and, and the weak interaction. Okay? But what happens is that the Higgs field breaks that symmetry. That's what the Higgs does, right? It's like a magnet. It points in a given direction. That's what the Higgs field is, like a magnet pointing in a given direction. And that aligns the weak field now to, to actually disassociate itself from the electromagnetic field right, and the weak field. And actually, the way that is done is quite artificial, if you really look at the details. And this is called the Weinberg angle. So what sets the Weinberg angle to be what it is, right, is kind of an input that you, you kind of put that answer in um, into the dynamics. What we would like is to actually, see the answer to your question is related to this, the origin of the parity violation. What are your views on the existence of firewalls around black holes? Um, you guys know what a firewall is? Put a wall of fire and fall into it. That's, so you know, there's this idea that you know, the Hawking radiation actually organizes itself when a black hole emits Hawking radiation into a wall of fire for an observer falling into the black hole. Um, I would say that even if firewalls exist or it doesn't exist, there's still a more fundamental question of information loss. And so <clears throat> you know, I, don't, I don't lose sleep over firewalls unless I find myself near one. <laughs> why did you ask that question? Oh, just, I'm just curious about, yeah, what, what, what are your stance on this? I guess you don't, you don't think either way. No, no it's, it's a good, good question. question. I mean, I think that uh, it's a real question of, do black holes only emit Hawking radiation, or does it absorb Hawking radiation? Right. All right. 